Good evening. Good evening and a warm welcome to this webinar lecture series number eight and the first one of 10 classes. And this series is called The Anthroposophical Path of Inner Work. And in these series, we're going to have many, many different topics to look at, and we're going to have different exercises. When I do my webinar classes on Tuesday mornings, all of you are completely engaged in moving with me, in engaging in activity. When we do a lecture series, I hope you will use the same process of being inwardly engaged. Please take this time to not multitask, because even listening to someone speak on the computer is an act of presencing together. And if you're multitasking in a spiritual sense, you're absencing yourself from what's happening. So I always ask you, please do your best not to multitask as we do our lessons but listen to what we're going to explore today, tonight, with your whole mind, with your whole heart. It is fine with me if you take notes. It's even fine with me if you have a journal and like to draw your way through the lesson, draw your way through the thoughts that you're having. But please, no dishes and no dinner. Thank you. All right. Because my principal spiritual path is in Eurythmy, and at least half of you know what Eurythmy is, but not all, but because that's my principal path, I want to open these classes with a short two or three minute Eurythmy experience. Please join me. And you can do this in sitting, or you can do it in standing. Please know that I can't see you. My image has been spotlighted so that you, I, you're not visible to me nor to anyone else. All right. In Eurythmy, we engage in a practice of mindful movement. These movements are not merely mindful. These movements are flowing. In flowing, they step out of being mere physical movements and they become what we call etheric movements, moving through time as well as through space. Not only that, there are also movements that are filled with a true spiritual picture. So we must feel our way and visualize our way into the movement. So please follow my narrative as we take this opening exercise, very familiar to some of you. Think of a seed, think of a full grown plant, think of the journey that the seed needs to make as it sprouts, sends seeds downwards, stem upwards, leaves unfolding, growing bigger, and then coming smaller again until it bursts into blossom. And when the flower is done, the petals fall to the ground, but the forces of the plant will be consolidated, contracted into a new seed. Through that, we have a picture also of all of the cycles of living and dying, becoming. And so in Eurythmy, we practice this experience of being seed or being open like a radiant flower. Will you join me? Begin by lightly placing your hands in front of your heart. And here you must internalize yourself and try to visualize the spiritual seed of your being. And now we're going to slowly, not, not at a snail's pace, but gradually open that seed of ourself. 
as if in opening, we discover the world. Even like the green leaves, they begin to breathe into the world. And in opening further and further, we become completely open like the flower to the sun. And then we take those spiritual sky star forces back into the new seed that is in our side, inside our cells. Spirit lays itself into the ground of your soul. Now you open again. Completely open to something so much grander than your everyday self. And now allow that spiritual nourishment to be laid into your heart. There in your heart, it takes root. And you feel, I am in the light. I am in the sun. I stand in that radiance. And that radiance gives itself fully over to me. It lives in me. In me, it becomes something that never was before, meanness. But I give all of that back in gratitude to everything that's greater than me. And from realms of light and warmth and sun and stars, I am reborn. And let's open one more time. And now in conclusion, please drop your arms to your side slowly and try to keep your feeling of being in the light as you drop your arms. And I invite you to try to feel both things at once. This light that surrounds us as human beings and the light that lives in your heart. And we'll be taking that up again in the course of the talking that I do. But we can also say this is part of a meditation that we'll turn to now and then. And this meditation is a contemplation on the feeling of the human being inside of spirit and spirit being in the human being. So I will give you these words now and try to remember them in relationship to the movements that we just did. And these words are, I am in God, or I am in spirit. And now, take all of that spirit, that light, that warmth, and feel, in me is spirit. In me is God. And you'll notice that I, as a Eurythmus, I talk with my arms. So I'm lifting and closing my arms as I say these words. In me, I am in God. And God is in me. And now I'm going to drop my arms. And now, not using my body, but using my mind, I will think those words and that movement together. I am in God. In me is God. And again, I am in God. In me is God. One last time. I am in God. In me is 
God. And if you prefer, you can use the word spirit. Either one works. But notice your human capacity to think in images. And this is one of the things that we'll be tracking as we go through this course. So this small exercise was an opening and to get us into the shared contemplation, the shared mood together. Now let's begin with some of the speaking for this evening. This course is a course that I've been asked to teach for a year or two years, and I've always felt hesitant to do so. This year, I'm ready to take it on with you, and I call it the Anthroposophical Path of Inner Work. There are many paths that we can pursue in our spiritual growth, in our spiritual development. We can pursue the path of yoga, for instance, or transcendental meditation, so many different paths. But in this course, we're going to focus on the anthroposophical path, the path that focuses on the knowledge of the human being as a spiritual being. And in the weeks of this course, we're going to learn exercises that we can do for our inner work, and we're going to practice them and learn what the meaning of them is and what parts of ourselves each of them develops or works on. And you'll learn how to do these at home and you'll learn why. And hopefully you'll commit to a personal practice, which is the sense of all of these exercises. And in our inner work in anthroposophy, we come to terms with this self that lives in the heart the self that is pure spirit. And we learn that this self is intimately connected with the world and with spirit. So we'll speak more about this, that this evening. In these weeks ahead, we're going to work on self-knowledge and we're going to work on exercises for changing our own habits and enhancing the way that we show up in our personal lives with positivity, with goodwill, control of the temper, and so on. We'll work with what is known as the six basic exercises, which some of you will already know about, which involved control of thinking, control of our will, practicing equanimity, open-mindedness, positivity, and trying to weave them into a way of life. In doing so, we're really working on sculpting our inner self, our personality, our astral body. We're going to work also with the Eightfold Path, which is the path of the Buddha. And it's interesting to know that that's integrated into the anthroposophical work. And the Eightfold Path is really a cultivation of the best practices of the human heart and the chakra, the heart chakra. We're going to work on exercises in thinking, in feeling, and in willing. We'll learn that thinking is valued extremely highly in the anthroposophical path, but it's not merely the associative, linear, or so-called dead thinking that we all work with in our daily lives. We're going to be working with cognizing, with understanding how our thinking works. Where does our understanding arise from? And learn that when we can pay attention to that, our understanding actually is our most spiritual capacity. But this has to be thinking that permeates and floods our heart as well lest it otherwise remain cold, brittle, and analytical, self-serving, if you will. We're going to work also with sense observation in our practice of thinking, because the observation 
grounds us in this world and in the path of anthroposophy, we value being embodied and incarnated in this world so highly. We'll also be working on the study of texts. It's called Lexio Divina, working on how to read a text and how to notice how that develops us in being able to think non-physical, non-linear thoughts. We'll be working on the feeling path through understanding the arts, including eurythmy, but also music and so on. Although I'm not going to teach you the different arts, but we'll look at their, their different gifts. And we'll work on the will by considering work. We will work on meditation and concentration and prayer. And then finally, we'll also be working on social relationships, our human interactions, our double, our critic, and also our karma, which is that those events that we meet in life that are often caused by a past life that we've set up for ourselves or that we're setting up into a future life and which are very much engaged with the community of people that we find ourselves in. So I want to go on to the question, why do we do inner work? Why do you do inner work? What are the characteristics of anthroposophical inner work? Inner work can never be, must never be, for self-gain. We can't do it to become wiser or sharper or have more power or have more money or to visualize success in our business. That's another path. And I will point out to you why we, we don't choose that. The path of anthroposophical inner work is for something else. It's in service to developing and evolving a higher self. I want to talk more about that in just a few minutes. But in anthroposophy, there are no rules. There are no rules for what you must do. In an anthroposophical spiritual path, it will never say you must not eat meat. You must not drink. <laughs> you, must, you, you must go to bed at a certain time every day. And you must, I don't know, wash your feet before you go into church. There are no rules. There are. There is no guru. Now, gurus, as most of you will know, are the teachers. And in since ancient days, gurus have played a very important role in society. Gurus were those initiates and exalted teachers who would show human beings who were possibly less dedicated to an inner path, less contemplative, would show human beings how to develop themselves. Gurus have been very important. They were like, if you will, fathers or father figures or teachers in a community. And a human being who chose to follow a guru learned to practice devotion, obedience on the one hand, which is a very good thing, and also devotional love. But in the path of anthroposophy, the choice is not to follow a guru. And that includes our relationship with Rudolf Steiner, the articulator of anthroposophy. He thoroughly rejected being considered a guru for anyone. True. He is a high initiate, but everyone who works with his material must question everything and feel free to go their own way. So there is no guru. There is no hope standing on top of the whole edifice of anthroposophy. There's no book of Ten Commandments or anything. There is a deep way to work. The core value of anthroposophy is the development of human freedom. I'll be building this thought in the next moments, 
but it's this picture of the self that's inside of us. The self is on a journey of becoming, and the self needs to be free in order to be able to give its unique value to the world. I'll come back to that in just a moment. But each person must be free, and this freedom must be born out of individuation, and its culmination is only rightful if it culminates in love. Out of freedom, which comes from profound separation, we can choose love, which creates relationship. Again, no compulsion, freedom. The anthroposophical perspective on this is that each person, each individual is finding their own way to their own core, finding their own way. And these cores are all born out of spirit equally, but they're all individual. We are essentially one and essentially individuated. Each one of us is finding our way to our own center. And in our age, the self needs to become our own, its own autonomous authority. So we have to go deep. What does that mean for our path of inner work? We're responsible, solely responsible for our own work. Once again, there are many paths that we can pursue, and there's old traditions of many paths. We can think back, for instance, to ancient India, where they spoke of the different karmas or yogas. There was bhakti yoga and karmic yoga and dharma yoga and raja yoga, different paths for different people. And in our age, of course, there are so many different spiritual streams certainly in America, but I've seen this in other communities in China, even where I travel around the world, so many different streams, also so many different religions. And that's fine. That rests on the old, old paths or the, we have this old understanding that all paths will lead to the same goal. Nonetheless, to the extent that a person's freedom is being compelled by any spiritual path, I will lay that aside. Um, every person must be free to choose whether they follow a particular path. Let me speak for just a moment about my own journey, if you will, and this will kind of set the stage for what goes forward. I was born in the Midwest of Chicago, actually, and I remember from a very young age that I knew that I was a spiritual seeker. And probably very many of you had that feeling, even if it's buried under deep layers of memory or forgetfulness. And through childhood, I was still seeking for that. And I remember back, for instance, to high school, 15, 16, 17, I was so engaged in ESP and, and Ouija boards and Edgar Casey, looking really for a spiritual path. And yet I couldn't find anything that would really touch my core. I was extremely intellectual, very intelligent. And I thought, I want to research ESP. I want to prove it to the world. I'm sure it's true, even though I myself didn't have those experiences. I attribute that a little bit to the practical down-to-earth experience of being from Chicago, really grounded Midwestern people. And I attribute it also to excelling at the scientific and logical thinking that I was educated in. And I had no artistic capacities as a child. It took me a long time. When I graduated from university studying math and physics and psychology, I decided to travel around the world. It was before many people were traveling. There were 
perhaps 10,000 people on the road then, but it was still rather unusual then. And I went to India looking for a guru. I couldn't find a guru. I went to Japan. I lived in Japan for a year studying with a spiritual master, but I still couldn't find what I was looking for, something that would really touch my core. I felt a deep hunger inside myself. And I offer that not only to talk about myself, but to extend a hand to you and say, do you have do you have a hunger? Do you want to be, to find your, your link? And finally, when I came back to, no, it was when I was in Japan, somebody gave me a book by Rudolf Steiner. I had only heard about him once before. That was when I was in India at the place of the Dharam, of Dharamsala, where the Dalai Lama was, whom I never saw. And then in Japan, Someone gave me a book by Rudolf Steiner. This well-worn copy has been with me for dozens of years. And the book is Knowledge of Higher Worlds and Its Attainment. And it's Rudolf Steiner's principal book for teaching this inner work path that we're taking. And I thought, this guy's pretty cool. He knows what he's talking about. But I did not recognize the immensity of what it was. And I gave the book back. Thank you very much. So proceeding on, um, I returned to the States from Japan. And a few months later, I was introduced to a eurythmist and did a little bit of eurythmy on the beaches in California. And my friend said, why don't you come with me and study this together? I said, but I'm a scientist. Why would I study art? But it lived deeply in my spirit. I believe it was a kind of recognition from a pre-birthly intention. And I began to study it. And I realized in that, that the, no, I will say this. When I met my teacher for my interview, she said to me, I do you with me because your rhythm is a path that will never end. And I thought, I'll give that one a try. And so right from the start of our first Eurythmy lessons, I discovered that this person, these people, my teachers, had a, a discipline, the discipline of Eurythmy, that was capable of taking me to my core, my very center. And I said, maybe I'll say another few months, another few months, a little bit longer. And in that time, we studied anthroposophy and did daily here with me for four years. And it truly has changed my life. And I've been doing that for many decades by now. And for me, anthroposophy, you with me, is living thinking. So in this book, Knowledge of Higher Worlds, Rudolf Steiner traces the path of inner work, beginning with preparation. And that entails what we do to get ourselves ready, living a healthy life. We'll deal with this more in the weeks to come. Living a healthy life, pursuing right relationships with other people, with our work, not being chaotic, not being sentimental, not trying to meditate into wish fulfillment, visualizing some sort of imagined future. No, learning how to have a centered inner life. That doesn't mean that we can't have joy and jubilation or even sorrow, but through it, the higher self knows itself to be the one that's having those experiences. Very interesting. So we, it's a cultivation of the inner life. So there's preparation, first step. Second step is called enlightenment, where one begins to actually perceive beyond the dimensions of the personal life, the personal astral body, if you will. And we begin to experience the reality of angels, archangels, elemental beings, creative spirit. And in Eurythmy, that also means learning to experience a reality 
of the etheric world, learning to experience what we do when we think, when we think, when we visualize thoughts, which I really look forward to working with on you, when working on with you. And when we have, when we think of a plant, a seed and the flower, actually to see that means that we're inscribing pictures out of our own intention into the etheric world. And those are spiritual realities, things like that. So preparation, enlightenment, and then when comes to the abyss, the gateway through which one has to pass going through tremendous trials to see if one is still carrying shadows, fear, hate, doubt in oneself, or if one is prepared to see the actual spiritual world and not harm oneself by meeting experiences that are too big for us and by not abusing the spiritual world by taking our own personal will into it. So those three steps, preparation, enlightenment, initiation. And I, as we get started here, I want to assure you, I'm not putting myself forth as an initiate. I'm still a beginner, but I'm graced by having had the training in your rhythm. So I really understand what we call the creative word, creative movement, creative powers, and how to sustain consciousness in the etheric world. But there's so there's so much that I am still working on. So please don't adulate me. And one more step, your own enlightenment is not your goal. And certainly when I was a child and I thought, I want to be enlightened. It's not the correct way to look at things. Your development itself, your evolution is the goal. It's the road that the fact that you are traveling, that you're working on changing yourself. But you do that not to become, as I said before, richer, more famous, more anything, but to be in service to creation. So we don't care about earthly riches, but we want to have our life in order. So there's no problem with having money, but we need a moral relationship to money. Everything that we do is having an effect on the entire universe. We're working on evolving the human race and what we do. What does this inner work lead to? To become free, the spirit self, within the constraints of our body and our soul. So listen to that one again. Inner work leads to us becoming free within the constraints of our body and the soul. We live in this body. We have the soul life that we live in with our moods, our emotions, our desires, our thinking, feeling, and willing. And these need to be understood as tools that we're working with, not as powers that we are proud of, not as delusory activities. These are tools that we use that are the expressions of our spirit in the soul. Inner work leads to understanding and awakening the spirit in oneself. And this is going to be then a path of pure freedom. And as I said earlier, this is the path of the white initiate. There can be people who go into these spiritual realms, barge into them, if you will, by using their own personal power, and then try to impose on other people's freedom. And we call that black initiates, or at the best, gray initiates, anyone who tries to impose on someone else's freedom. However, we must understand that freedom is hard won. Freedom doesn't mean just the freedom to do anything one wants. 
freedom arises when we're able to think clearly and truthfully without having the body or our habits, our culture, our norms, our privilege, without having any of that determine how we're thinking. It's a free spiritual activity. And in this, anthroposophy is like a temple, a house that is wide open. It's not any particular point of view. It is profoundly connected with Christianity, but Christ as a spirit of love, not in the sense that it's represented in uh, any kind of restrictive or dogmatic religion. Christ as the love, which is all of the universe coming into the human being. Anthroposophy is connected to that, but there's place to understand every other religion, every other path. It's a door that's wide open, accepting anything that accepts our freedom. So let me take the next step about this responsibility that we carry as a spiritual seeker. Some of you are already familiar with much of anthroposophy. Maybe all of you are. I wish I knew. Um, and some of you have studied my favorite book, which is called An Outline of Esoteric Science. And I've already given a webinar on that last year, two years ago, and I'm going to do it again this year um, in the spring of 23. And you know that we speak of the beginning of time. We actually go back to that and speak about the becoming of our world. This only very approximately recognizes a timeline, and we are somewhere on this timeline. But I drew this circle first, and I want to ask you to create this picture like we did in Eurythmy of the great boundless universe, the world, the spiritual creative world. And from all of this, or behind all of this, are spiritual beings. And I will even venture so far as to say, we can look to the stars and the stars are all like doorways to different spiritual beings, but they come to us in the sense world, the stars, the spiritual beings are even behind that. They're behind what we see. They're pure powers and characteristics, the highest beings. Lower spiritual beings are embedded in manifestation. But let me take the next step. Our experience is that our earth is in the middle of this creation. Partly true. It is certainly true for our, our perspective. But I want I drew this to ask you to try to understand a basic tenant of anthroposophy that matter, the material world is condensed spirit. If that's the first time you've heard that thought, think it, think it hard. Matter is condensed spirit. There's not a dichotomy between spirit and matter. They're not two separate things. Matter is a condensation of all of these powers of the universe, as if they have all put their dreams, their thoughts, their intentions, their love, their wisdom, their guidance, and compacted it into a manifest world. So let me use that third term again, manifest world that appears in the sense world. And so here we are in one location, the only one that I know about, our earth, and all around us are <laughs> blue pen <laughs> that are or is our world of nature. I'm not trying to make this a particularly complex diagram. All around us on the earth, clouds, 
soil, minerals, trees, rocks, all of that created with a different gesture out of the thoughts and dreams of spirit. It all belongs together, animals, plants. So what are we as human beings? We are, each one of us, a point of individuated spirit. Each one of us has inside this body that we wear some of that inside of us some of that spirit inside of us it is it has it moves beyond the laws of space beyond the laws of time through the laws of pure original being it lives inside of us and in our consciousness in our heart consciousness, we find that. We're going to stick with this for a little while with this thought. And Rudolf Steiner, I would like to speak to you a verse that Rudolf Steiner gives. And it's with these words. As we try to find our spiritual self, this verse says, more radiant than the sun. Purer than snow, finer than the ether, is the self, the spirit in my heart. I am this self. This self am I. I do believe that all of you and every healthy human being senses this selfness and probably loses it daily in the constraints and demands of life. But again and again, we return to this. It is the self that needs to learn to deal with your emotional body with your life body, with your physical body. It is the self inside you that needs to deal with your karma, with the people that you work, working with, that you live with, with your tasks in life. It's the self which has to deal with your temper, has to deal with your habits of how you do things. It's quite clear what I'm referring to here. And the picture at the heart of anthroposophy is that now, in, the, in these centuries that we live in, looking back about 500 centuries, but that's, that's another part of the story. In these centuries that we live in, the new capacity lives in the human being to awaken and awaken to, and work out of this self. That's really what the inner work is headed towards. To awaken to the self that's able to think a thought that is pure spirit. That's able to access freedom, our core. That's what we are. If we don't do this, and here is an urgent, urgent call out of the world of anthroposophy. If we don't awaken to that, then we continue to live our lives purely in response to our outer environment, purely in response to our biology, in response to our family, to our wounds, to our habits, our cultural customs, the constraints of our nation, the constraints of, yeah, climate change, all of this. We live, we are unfree in those things. And the call to become enlightened or to do your inner work means to very honestly learn to be mature and awake in the way that you deal with the world. Right, beginning with the way that you deal with yourself. Rudolf Steiner in this book, Knowledge or um, 
an outline of esoteric science, speaks about how important it is that the human being takes responsibility for the future. In this book, he has four, the major part of this book is an immense 200 page chapter called The Evolution of the Earth, of the World. And he goes in this evolutionary story from the beginning of time through many phases of becoming until he comes to our present time. And then we're all, we readers are eager to say, and how's the story going to end? And he says, stop, I can't write anymore in this chapter. I have to do a chapter on inner work. And the next chapter he spends, he writes exclusively about the awakening of the human ego. Because what we do now determines the whole course of the story. Will we become empowered? Will we be able to take up our freedom? Will we be able to become beings of love? Will, be, will we be able to become new beginners worthy of the gift of life that was given us or not? And if not, then this whole extraordinary thing that we live in, creation, comes puttering to a tragic end. But we can do it. We're, we've been given that power. In one of his essays, Rudolf Steiner says, look, think about the way people talk about the earth. One way we might talk about it is to say that the earth is insignificant, just a dust the great cosmos, so many other stars, so many other planets, we are insignificant. And Steiner says in this essay, in a certain point of view, that's true or very small, but on another point of view, what has been given to us humans is an enormous seed force. And just think of the tininess of a mustard seed, the tininess of something that is waiting to become, that is like this seed in our heart. And we can awaken that, we can do something, and that will change the whole course of everything as we learn to create out of our love, create out of our consciousness. So much more to talk about. I think we can, I could also bring it like this. We can ask, is a human being a finished creation? Maybe if we consider that the human being is just a body, just a created being. But we could also say the human being is a being of becoming. And it's this becoming that looks at what we can do if we do our inner work. But if we stay passive in our biographies, there's nothing more. So our work of doing inner work is to not just serve our own wealth in this lifetime or our fame and fortune. Our duty in this lifetime is to serve the becoming of the universe, of the whole this creation, to create a, a life of service, not out of self-love, out of world love. Now, if I look at the biography of Rudolf Steiner, who was a high initiate, he lived his path of inner work without compromise, extraordinarily seriously in the choices that he made for eating, for sleeping, for disciplining, for being there available for people, thinking, and his spiritual research went far and deep. I'm not that rigorous with myself. Probably none of you are either. And we don't have the laws, the commandments of church and gurus and so on to tell us that we have to do it. But we're responsible to this gift of life to do our level best with our discipline, with our self-becoming. Your spirit is the part of you 
that does your inner work. Your spirit is the one that you need to take hold of, that I need to take hold of, to tell myself how I'm going to develop, well, what I need to work on, and become ever more selfless, but not egoless. So in our anthroposophical terminology, we use the word ego as a very positive quality. The ego, the I am, the self is this divine gift that we have. So now as I begin to come towards the end, I'm going to read a couple of things to you and give us a little bit of, a, of a, an assignment for this week. I'm going to read first something from an, a Waldorf teacher, Johannes Tautz, who wrote this. Man is a being in process of becoming. The human being has received the self-consciousness as an earth being by tangible, sensible interaction with the external world. We have brought the physical world under our dominion. Within the consciousness soul, however, that conscious part of our inner life, Within our consciousness, so we are able to grasp ourselves as the bearer and the creator of our own inner world. How you respond to things, how you do things. Yeah. The challenge is now to temper the soul moods, the sympathies and the antipathies, which can intensify to love and hate and the soul storms which follow from them. The challenge is to learn to develop the new soul qualities which are rooted in the spirit. In this way, little by little, the consciousness of one's own spirit nature can arise. The consciousness of one's own spirit nature can arise. A precondition to this is systematic self-development, that is, Education by the higher self who becomes one's own spiritual guide. Take the time to think about this. Take the time to think about this. How, how do we access that spiritual guide? Our higher self. I like to say we need times during our day when we look at our self from the outside. Learn to discern what's essential and what's non-essential in our lives. Look at yourself objectively. Look at yourself as if from a mountaintop, looking down at how that body and that personality are doing. Not all the time. But we should work on the skill to be able to do that even while we're living our lives. And as you do that in your self-reflection to learn, to ask yourself, how did you become the personality that you are? If you've got a pencil there and you're writing things down, write these four short questions. How did you become the personality that you are? Who are you grateful to? What part of you is really you? What part of yourself do you want to work on? So as I dare to teach this 10-week course on inner work, I think... What I can offer you are tools, but the inner work is what we each have to do for ourselves. So as I said, I will I offer to give you different exercises to work on. And this is what I want to give you this week. And it's written in the PDF that you'll get with this lesson. It has to do with coming to terms with 
your own core and how much of your personality has been built into you by the situations of your life and the people who live with you. And they live, they have affected your core. And in this exercise, you try to see the results of their actions on you. And at the same time, increasingly become aware of the core of other people, the divine human spark in everyone. Of course, this is a path that takes years, takes a lifetime, but we'll start now. So I'll read this. And as I said, you will get it in the handout. Zoom out, maybe I should say there's no hands here. Through a deepening of social life, a new understanding of the human being must be found and must permeate human development. Instead of having eyes only for the flesh of the human being, apprehending them in a natu naturalistic way, devoid of spirit, we must reach the stage of a spirit-filled social organism wherein the activity of the gods in other people can be recognized. But we shall not attain to this unless we do something about it. One thing that we can do is to strive to deepen our own life of soul. There are many paths to that. I will mention only one, a meditative path. From various points of view and with various aims, we cast a backward glance over our lives. I should mention this whole page that I'm going to read are words of Rudolf Steiner. We can ask ourselves, how has this life of mine unfolded since childhood? Instead of bringing before our gaze what we ourselves have enjoyed or experienced, we can turn our attention to the persons who have figured in our lives as parents, brothers and sisters, friends, teachers, and so on. And we can summon before our soul the inner nature of each of these persons in place of our own. What do I know of the divine inner other person? After a time, we shall find ourselves reflecting how little we really owe to ourselves and how much to all, how much we owe to all that has flowed into us from others. If we honestly build up this kind of self scrutiny into an inner picture, we shall arrive at quite a new relationship to the outer world. From such a backward survey, we retain certain feelings and impressions. And these are like fertile seeds planted in us, seeds for the growth of the true knowledge of the human being. Whoever undertakes again, excuse me, please. Whoever undertakes again and again this inward contemplation so that they recognize the contribution which other persons, perhaps dead or long distance, what other persons have made to our own life, then when we meet another person and establish a personal relationship with them, an imagination of that other person's true being rises in front of us. Can you imagine a social life based in which human beings worked with one another in that way? That you would not see the flesh and the skin color, the body size, the type, the grimaces, whatever of another nor would you just see their personality there. You would know this is a divine being, regardless of my sympathy and antipathy. I will to be seen as a divine being, and I must learn to see that in others. All right. With that, I'm going to close this evening's talk, and I'll leave a little bit of word, work, a little bit of time for questions. And I leave you with an invitation to do this work this week, 
and continue it for as much of the rest of your life as you like to. And I would recommend to you that throughout these 10 weeks that you actually take time to do at least some or all of the exercises which I offer to you so that you're really working on your inner life. And it can always help you if you journal things as you go forward, so that you actually make sure to think things through to a kind of culmination. Right? With my best wishes, I thank you for your attention. And we have something less than 10 minutes for me to see your questions and possibly also your wishes in case I'm able to do anything more than all the other things I have planned for you. Thank you very much. And many thanks to Michelle, who is my host and ground person. All right, Michelle, do we have any questions? We do not yet. It might yeah. come. But I was going to say, you, you asked us to be focused and not multitask and I'm guessing putting questions in the chat might have been <laughs> <laughs> might have felt like multitasking okay mm -hmm. um Shashi has one and I bet she is typing so we will just wait patiently okay and breathe um, and I hope I was of service Oh, yes. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Um, Nitu said, very interested in knowing more about how the process of initiation looks. Good. Nitu, that will come later because in initiation, we're not going to... I'm, mm, we talk about the guarding of the threshold, about yeah, the trials that one goes through. I'm not going to talk about going to a temple and like we have the wonderful ancient traditions, the traditions of going through a sleep and temple sleep and so on. Maybe I'll, I'll can speak about the old traditions, but um, we have to wait a bit for that. Yeah. Okay. Um, Sanu said, do we get any books to read? I have given you the names of a couple of books in the um in the notes, including this as the primary book, Knowledge of Higher Worlds. And I will give you more going forwards. A very, very helpful book is called Start Now. And Start Now is a compilation of nearly every exercise that Rudolf Steiner gave. Very, very helpful. Um, not written by him, but written by Christopher Manford, compiled by him. Oh, yes. <laughs> okay, let's see. Next, Janine said, can we also close with Eurythmy in future sessions, please? <laughs> yeah, it feels like it, doesn't it? You know, if we, have, if we don't have any more questions, we're going to close with contraction expansion again right now. <laughs> okay, we have we have one more question at the moment from Shashi. Um, okay, Shashi said, so can these exercises you will be unfolding, could you guide us in cycles, say, of 21 days and then review personal or collective? Maybe you can tell me a little bit more about that later on, Sashi. Sashi, what? Um, um, yeah, and and maybe my good friend Michelle will have some interest, some ideas about that too. Okay. And and Sashi said sure. So um, I bet you will get an email. Okay. okay. Let's see. Our Bethany says. I didn't quite get the process of looking back at the other people from our lives. No question, but I look forward to reading that wording again. Probably got it. Yeah. yeah. You've got it on the, on the handout. Yeah. Okay. One more question came up. No, it's gratitude. Just Thank gratitude. You, Thank you, Malcolm. <laughs>
<laughs> Dear friends, if you would like to join me in doing once again this contraction expansion, I would be ever so happy to host that one. So standing in your space or sitting in your chairs, take your hands to your heart. Think of that self in me. I am that self more radiant than the sun, purer than snow, finer than the ethers is the self, the spirit in my heart. And now let's bring the self into breathing as the self expands to acknowledge the world out of which we have come and accepts in gratitude all of the forces of creation, even as yourself came into a body at birth and yourself unfolds all of its unique gifts and comes into the body at birth. And we look around us at the world. The world fills us. I am in God. God is in me. One more time, open, feel yourself just breathing in such harmony. And now drop your arms. Dropping your arms. Feel the livingness of your own presence. Him here. Thank you. And friends, you may you may um, write uh, to me at info at eurythmyonline.com. You can bring me your, your questions and yeah, let me know what you're what you're thinking. Thank you so much. And I will see you next week and you can look for the recording in an hour or two. <laughs>